Hello and welcome to topic two, lecture two. And in this top lecture, we're going to be taking a look at the United States Constitution. What we're going to be looking at in this lecture is we're going to look at the movement from the Articles of the Confederation to the Constitution of the United States. Um, we're going to do a brief outline of looking at what is included in the Constitution. And then we're going to take a look at the so-called architecture of democracy. So let's get started. So as I mentioned in the last lecture, after the United States or the colonies declared independence, the next thing that they needed to do is they needed to create a constitution for this new nation. And the first constitution of the United States is what is known as the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. And it basically, this document, like any constitution, um, establishes the institutions of government for that nation and also identifies the powers that that government has. Um, and so since this is a national constitution, um, the Articles of Confederation establish that there will be a governmental institution. Um, the national government, there's only one national governmental institution, um, and that is the, the Congress, um, the legislative branch. There is no um, institution of the executive. There's no president of this new nation. There's no judiciary. Um, there's only one governmental institution, and that is Congress. And, you know, the reason for that was, and, you know, they talk about this in your chapter, is that, you know, as these colonies are declaring independence and creating this new nation, uh, they're basically really um, apprehensive about creating a national government that is going to get a lot of power and basically abuse its power because they just got out of a situation being ruled by the king of Great Britain that was a tyrant that abused their power. Um, and so the goal of the Articles of Confederation was to severely limit the power of national government and to magnify the powers of the states. And how they achieved that uh, was in creating, as the title of the, uh, the, the declaration, or I'm sorry, the title of the first constitution indicates, is that they created a confederation. And what a, a federation is, is that basically it gives most of the power to the states, to the individual states. And so it's, as it says there, that the states have the sovereign, have sovereign authority except for the powers that are expressly granted to the national government in the constitution. And so the national government did have some powers. Um, the national government was able to, um, you know, uh, declare war, create treaties, appropriate money, but nine out of the 13 states needed to agree for Congress to take power. So it was kind of limited. The states had sort of like almost the, 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 the final say in terms of whether um, uh, uh, war could be declared. Um, they could appoint generals to serve in the army, but the federal government had no standing army. The national government or the federal government was really composed just of the state militias. So if we needed an army, the state militias would come and fight, but there was no standing national army like there is today. Um, they couldn't regulate foreign and interstate uh, commerce, etc. You can read more about the weaknesses or the limitations that are placed on the national government under the Articles of Confederation. Bottom line was goal, the goal was to limit federal power because they were really worried that giving a lot of power to the national government would result in abuse and to magnify and give a lot of power to the individual states. Now, as your textbook points out, the extreme limits placed on the power of the national government make the, made the Articles um, of Confederation really unworkable. It was, it was an impractical document. It was a good expression of their values of limiting the power, but when the national government's power was so limited, it really made it very difficult for the national government to do its job. Uh, for example, uh, it was unable to raise taxes without the uh, federal taxes without the approval of the states. Um, the, the United States had a huge uh, war debt that it owed to France to help pay France for the assistance that they gave us during the Revolutionary War. Um, but the states refused to raise money to pay off the debt. And so in, in, in ways, it was sort of hurting our national, national and international standing. And so the, the Articles of Confederation just didn't have the tools necessary for this new national government to survive. And so in 1786, um, the state of Virginia 
invited delegates from the 13 states to come to a convention in Maryland. And it was called the Annapolis Convention. And the point of this conven convention was to discuss the problems with the Articles of Confederation and try to come up with some solutions to those problems. Well, not a lot of state delegates actually attended the Annapolis Convention. So not a lot of substantive work could get done at that convention. However, one thing that did happen at the Annapolis Con Convention is a revolution, I'm sorry, a resolution was passed that basically said that states were to send delegates to Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. And for all practical purposes, that is what turned out to be the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. And what started, so the, rev, the, the resolution that was passed at the Annapolis Convention was to come together to revise the Articles of Confederation, but that's ultimately, as we know, what, not what happened. Um, what started as a revision resulted in the creation of an, a brand new Constitution of the United States. Okay, so the Constitutional Convention took place in Philadelphia uh, and it lasted for five months from May of 1787 to October. Um, and state delegates were selected by their state governments to be sent to the Constitutional Convention. Um, it was um, uh, about uh, 70 individuals were selected to attend the Constitutional Convention, but in the end, um, 55 delegates attended the Constitution. And it was those delegates that basically, you know, crafted and debated and um, ultimately assigned on to the Constitution, although the Constitution itself needed to be ratified by the states. Um, um, some of the famous people from the first founding um, did not attend the Constitutional Convention. Um, so both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, both of which were appointed to the committee um, uh, the, that wrote the Declaration of Independence, uh, neither of them attended the Constitutional Convention. Both of them were doing work overseas in Europe. Um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was also a part of the, um, the committee that wrote the Declaration of Independence, he did attend the Constitutional Convention. Uh, he was one of the oldest members too. And um, probably most importantly is James Madison, okay? And so James Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton, uh, those are the authors of the Federalist Papers. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Federalist Papers are those essays that were published to make a case for the ratification of the Constitution. And those three gentlemen, Jay, Hamilton and Madison were the ones that were most involved in the crafting and the construction of the United States Constitution. And many people consider James Madison to be the so-called found uh, father of the United States um, Constitution, although I think Hamilton would take some issue with that claim. Before we um, talk about the goals of the Constitutional Convention and what sort of happened and transpired at the Constitutional Convention, let's just take a look at the, the outline of the Constitution itself. Um, we're gonna spend the rest of the semester basically looking at these different articles of the Constitution, particularly when we get into talking about the institutions of government, Congress, the presidency, the judiciary. But even next week, we're going to begin taking a look at the Constitution because federalism, as you're going to see in a moment, is outlined and um, described within the Constitution. So the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution that was ratified by the states um, in, seven, in 1788 was comprised of seven articles, okay? So there are seven articles to the original Constitution. Now today, um, you know, obviously we have a way of amending the Constitution. And so today we have 27 amendments to the Constitution. So today the Constitution is seven articles and 27 amendments. As we're gonna learn when we get to the chapter on civil liberties, the first 10 amendments um, to the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. And as you learn in this chapter, and we'll learn later on that many of the states were, uh, they, did, they were un, unwilling or hesitant to ratify the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. And um, James Madison and other Federalists realized that, look, we're not gonna get this Constitution ratified unless we tell the states that we will add a Bill of Rights as one of the first acts post-ratification. 
And in fact, that's what they did. And we'll talk about that later in the semester. So right away, well, pretty much right away, by 1791, the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution. But the original Constitution that was ratified had seven articles. Um, so Articles 1, 2, and 3 establish the institutions of government, okay? So Article 1 establishes the Congress, tells us that we're going to have two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives, tells us how members are selected. It's going to tell us the powers of Congress. Article 2, and you're going to be learning this throughout the semester. Article 2 establishes the presidency um, and tells us the power that the president has. And Article 3 establishes the, the federal courts. Um, it is Article 3 establishes the Supreme Court of the United States and then gives Congress the power to establish the lower level federal, federal courts. Um, the other, other articles, uh, and let me just put them up here uh, so that we can just take a look at them. Um, Article 4 through 7 uh, deal with other matters and concerns of this national government. Um, since we were making this transition from a confederation that gave tons of powers to the states to a more a constitution that creates more robust powers for the national government um, article four talks about the the relationship uh that the, the 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 that the national government has to the states and also tells states what their relationship is to other states it also tells us about how new states can be admitted to the united states Article 5 is about the amendment process. We're not going to talk about that in lecture, but it's in the textbook for this in Chapter 2. Um, Article 7 tells us what the legal status of the Constitution is and, and basically what Article, I'm sorry, Article 6, not 7. What Article 6 tells us is that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land and that federal law is supreme over state laws. Um, unless otherwise um, designated by the Constitution. So Article 6 establishes federal supremacy. And then Article 7 tells us about how the, the, um, this new Constitution will be ratified. So that's an overview or an outline of the Constitution, and we'll be filling in all the details throughout the course of the semester. The type of government being created in the United States uh, was a democracy we know that right uh, a republic a representative form of democracy um and at the time period in the 18th century you know very few if any governments or countries um had democracy had a, a democratic or constitutional form of government and so this new sort of experiment the american experiment right creating this republic and you know empowering people with the ultimate authority when it comes to governmental decisions um, that was a new and worrisome form of government. Um, it's not that we didn't know about democracies. We did. Um, but in the world, you know, the thinking was that democracies were unstable um, and they, they wouldn't last long. And in fact, they could be sort of dangerous. Um, the thinking was that people are can be very self-interested. They have a hard time seeing what is for the good of the group and putting to side their own personal interests. Um, and so there was, you know, worry that in a democracy that you would, you know, that it would be rule of the factions, um, those who were just looking out for their own interest and didn't give a crap about the interests of others, and they would get into power and it could actually be a pretty dangerous type of government. And so, you know, the thinking was, is that maybe authoritarian government having a king who is enlightened and able to, and educated and able to sort of see the good for the country, right, and promote the common good, I mean, maybe that was a better style of government because you can't, it, you know, it's dangerous to trust people to, with that, you know, that, that mighty task of looking out not for themselves, but for the whole. And our framers, the framers of the Constitution knew that. They knew that they were in, in um, that the American experiment was um a challenge and that it very well may not survive and actually coming out of the articles of confederation there was a real sense that boy at least under that constitution um the kind of democracy that was going to be created was unstable and the you know there was strife in the states and uprisings the shays rebellion in massachusetts and there was a sense that you know we might this democracy might just fail and so the drafters of the constitution knew 
that in order for the United States to survive and thrive, it needed to create a democracy that had a structure that kept specific challenges to democracy in check. And that's what I'm referring to as the architecture of democracy. That if you want to have a democracy that's going to last and it's actually going to be able to function as a democracy, you need to have a certain structure in place to keep those things that threaten a democracy, bringing it to its knees. You need to have a structure in place that basically keeps a check on those threats to democracy. And so the, a democracy needs to control the so-called mischief of the factions that are outlined in James Madison's uh, Federalist Paper Number 10, which is in the back of your textbook. Factions are groups of people that bind together, that are they're promoting their own interests, and they don't care about the interests of others. And if those kinds of groups get power, they can be very, very dangerous for democracy. Um, another thing that uh, the the framers of the Constitution was concerned about was tyranny of the majority. Um, that is that democracies are oftentimes um, that the majority rules, that what the majority of people want, that that's what gets enacted. But we can know that the majority could be, be um, not looking out for the rights of those who are not in the majority. Uh, and so that with too much democracy, without some breaks on democracy, you can have excessive democracy that when uh, whatever the majority wants gets enacted, even if it tramples on the rights of those not in the majority. So our framers were really mindful of that as well. And as we're going to see on the next slide, that the framers were very um, concerned about that if you are going to create a national government that has a lot of power, you better put some limitations and checks on the power of government because individuals can abuse their power. But when individuals bind together in a government, they can abuse their power as well. And in fact, the, the, the abuse of power of a group can be much more ha harmful to a society than the abuse of power by an individual. So let's take a look at a quote from James Madison, one of his Federalist Papers that he wrote. And then let's look at the architecture of democracy and how these structures were put in place to create a functional democracy. So I want to read a passage from the Federalist Paper number 51 written by James Madison. And it's in the back of your textbook if you want to take a look at it. In that paper, he writes, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the govern, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience hath, has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. Now I want you to pause the video right now and keep that up on the slide, okay? Keep the slide up. I want you to just take out a pen, paper, and I want you to translate that. Like, what do you think that means? Translate it into your own words, okay? Just take a few moments to do that and then unpause and come back to the video. Hey, welcome back. So what did you write? Um, you know, I think what James Madison is getting at here is that, look, if men were angels, angels are perfect. They always do the right thing. They're always looking out for the good of others, not the good of themselves. They're angels. They probably just don't even have those kinds of self-interested desires. And so if men were angels, you wouldn't need government because government is about making decisions, putting laws in place to make sure that people don't hurt or abuse others or engage in immoral or unethical actions. Um, but if, gov if, if men were angels, you wouldn't need a government. And if angels were to govern over men, right, you wouldn't really need any external controls over government because angels are always going to be making the right decisions. That's not the world we live in, right? Um, he's basically saying that, look, if we're going to create a government that where humans are govern going to govern over other humans, um, that you have to make sure that you first enable the government to, con um, to control the governed because that's the purpose of government, right? Um, they're there to keep order, right? And to help make decisions, um, keep us secure. 
But you also have to make sure that the government, it, it's going to be controlling the people it's governing over, but it needs to control itself too. Um, and so he says that, look, you know, oftentimes the, because we have popular sovereignty, the people are the primary control in government. If they're abusing their power, um, then we're supposed to like be aware that they're abusing their power and then we're not going to elect them the next time. We're going to kick them out of office. But Madison's smart. He says, yeah, that's a good first step. But we're going to need other things in place. That's what he means by auxiliary precautions. We're going to need additional precautions beyond the check that the people place on the government if we're going to make this government work. Um, and so, you know, I think that when he talks about the, the necessity of these auxiliary precautions, he's really talking about that we need to craft a constitution that has certain mechanisms in place to make sure that if the people fail to check the government, there's other mechanisms in place to check the power of the government. I wanna draw your attention to this great article called by Danielle Allen. You're gonna be watching a little video by her. She's a, uh, a political philosopher and a scholar of the constitution and beyond. And she wrote this um, great article in the Atlantic magazine called The Flawed Genius of the Constitution. And, you know, she says, look, you know, we look at the Constitution and some of the really abhorrent things that took place in the Constitutional Convention, the decision to continue with slavery, right? No, I mean, slavery was not ended at the Constitutional Convention. Not only that, but, you know, those who were held in slavery were counted as three-fifths of a person for purposes of uh, apportionment and representation in the House of Representatives. Um, that's some pretty awful shit excuse my language right that's some pretty awful stuff um but what you know daniel allen says in 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 her article she says that out of these flaws um that there are things that in uh, that um that are are in the constitution uh that are specific mechanisms to move government in the direction of better serving the people so even though there are flawed aspects of the Constitution, there are mechanisms in place to make sur sure that um, uh, that government doesn't abuse its power, that the majority doesn't rule over those uh, and trample the rights of those in the minority, um, and it makes sure that the government's not going to trample on the rights of the individual or that one branch isn't going to dominate over other branches, okay? And so if you get a chance to look at the flawed genius of the Constitution, you're just going to have to look it up on your own, or maybe I'll put it in, in links as optional readings. Um, that's exactly what Daniel Allen's talking about, the architecture of democracy, that we need mechanisms in place to move our government to better serve the needs of the people and the will of the people. So let's take a look at what some of those mechanisms are. Okay, so one of the mechanisms that's in place in our Constitution is putting the brakes on the majority rule, okay? Now, majority rule is a good thing in democracy. You want the will of the people to be enacted. But sometimes the majority can trample upon the rights of those who end up not in the majority. Um, this kind of comes to a head when uh, at the Constitutional Convention that when it came to um, the, 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 the Congress, the institution of government that's really the closest to the people there were debates at the constitutional convention about how those how the 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 national legislature how congress should be um organized w what kind of institution should it be and as you read in your textbook there were two plans that were discussed at the con the constitutional convention um, one was the virginia plan and the other is the new jersey plan so let me just put these up here and then we'll talk about each of those separately um, now, the Virginia plan was put forth by Virginia, and at the time, you know, Virginia was the most populous state. So it put forth a plan that he, it felt would benefit itself and benefit the more popular, the more populous states, those states that had more people living in them. And so in the Virginia plan, they wanted all of the representation in Congress to be based on population. So the bigger your state was, the more populous it was, the more representatives you would get in the National Congress. Not only that, they wanted there to be two houses, bicameral. That's what that word bicameral means, two chambers. They're what, they wanted there to be two houses for the Congress. And furthermore, they wanted the, the lower house to be based on population, okay? And so states that were bigger would get more say in the lower house. And then the upper house and the other house um, the members of the lower house would select 
who is going to be representing them in the, the other chamber, okay? So it gives us tremendous amount of power to the large states. New Jersey, a smaller state, said, wait a second, you know, that's not fair. Yes, it should be majority rules, but if the most populous states get to make all the decision, the interests of the small states are not going to be taken into consideration in decision making. The will of the majority will trample over those who aren't in the majority. And so New Jersey said, look, all states should be equal players. We should all get one vote or equal representation in our, our federal legislature. And there shouldn't be two houses. It should be unicameral, uni meaning one. There should be one chamber. Each state gets equal representation, okay? So you can see where this is going. Um, either of those plans would be not best for democracy, right? Um, that you needed a way in which we had a democracy that represented the will of the people, but that um, did that represented the will of the people in a way that they'd have to take the concerns of those not in the majority into consideration. The New Jersey plan could be equally dangerous because if you're giving every state the equal say, it really diminishes the power of the more popular states. Virginia would get the same state say as, let's say, Rhode Island or one of the smaller states. That doesn't seem fair either. And so there's a compromise that it's known as the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise. And it's this compromise that puts the brakes on the tyranny of the majority. In the Connecticut plan, they created a bicameral, so they took a piece out of the Virginia plan. They said, we are going to have two, two houses. Um, we're going to have the House of Representatives or two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, the House is going to be based on representation. So the more people that live in your state, the more voice you'll get in the House. But the Senate will be based on every state getting the same say. Two senators for every state, regardless of how populous that was. And for bills to get through the Congress, they have to make their ways through both of the houses, not just one. Um, and so it, it basically, you have majority rules in the House, but the smaller states get more say in the Senate, thus putting the brakes on the, the, the potential tyranny of the majority. So the House is based on population, and as we know, the Senate is all states are equal in representation. So that's one of the mechanisms that's in place to put the um, to make sure that a power isn't abused. And in this case, it would be power being abused by the majority. Another mechanism that was put in place by the framers is known as separation of power. So, um, you know, they're trying to put mechanisms in place that regardless of whether angels or devils are at the helm, there's certain architectures within our democracy that makes it very difficult to abuse power. And separation of powers is one of those things. Now, in some um, democracies, governmental powers are merged, okay? And so if you've taken a class on comparative politics, you know, some democracies have what are known as a parliamentary form of government. And what a parliamentary form of government is, is it's a fusion of powers. And so the, the, the decision-making branch, the legislature, oftentimes known as the parliament, that whichever party wins the majority in the parliament, they're the ones who form the executive branch, okay? Who form the prime minister and the prime minister then's cabinet. And so the powers aren't separated out. It's sort of like whoever has power in the lawmaking branch, they get to decide who's going to have power in the executive branch. Um, the framers, you know, thought that that merger of power like that was really dangerous because if you have angels, that's great because angels are going to do the right thing when they're forming the, the prime ministership and the prime minister's cabinet. But if you have people that are interested in, war, you know, abusing their power and they win the majority in the parliament, they're going to continue to abuse their power when they get into the prime minister's office and beyond. And so our framers put a mechanism in place that said, let's separate those powers out. Um, rather than merging the executive branch with the legislative branch, let's cre create three distinct institutions of government and have those powers separate and unique. And so the separation of powers is the division of power into separate groups that must ultimately cooperate to get anything done in government. Um, in our system, power is separated into the lawmaking branch, the legislative branch, the executive branch, the branch that puts decisions into action, and the judiciary branch that settles disputes between the other branches. And each institution has its own distinct powers and they're outlined in the constitution. So the powers of the legislature, Article One, the power of the executive branch, Article 2, the powers of judiciary, Article 3. 
And what's cool about um, uh, about the separation of powers is that there's natural competition between the branches to hold each other accountable. So if the executive branch starts dancing in the powers of the legislative branch, then the legislative branch is going to tell the executive branch to back off and to get back in its lane. And it's going to basically say that you don't have the power to do that. Likewise, if the legislative branch starts doing things that only the judiciary is supposed to do or only the executive branch is supposed to do, well then, they're going to say, get back in your lane, get out of our, our designated and delineated powers. It's also easier to hold people accountable if power is limited. Um, that if the executive branch and its powers abuses its power, you know, you know who to blame. The legislative branch abuses its delegated powers, its, its you know, designated powers, you know who to blame. So again, it gives more power to the people to put the brakes on the abuse of power of government. Here's the chart from your um, textbook that I just have it up here, but I'm encouraging you to take a look at it in your textbook. Um, you know, it talks about the, the powers that the legislative branch has, the powers that the executive branch has, and the power that the judicial branch has. So make sure that you take a look at that so that you understand how these powers are separated into different institutions. Another mechanism that the framers put in place in order to keep a check on power is this thing called checks and balances. And what checks and balances are is that um, it's each branch participates and influences the other branches. In other words, um, that to get anything done, one branch basically needs to cooperate or get the approval of another branch. Um, it, it, there are very limited opportunities for one branch to do anything without the oversight and approval of another branch. Um, there are some examples like the president's pardon power. Um, that is a unilateral power, but there aren't a lot of examples of that in our constitution. And so um, you, branches can't exercise power without the oversight or participation of another branch. Um, and so that basically it provides this natural check um, on the power of government because institutions have to depend on other institutions to get things done. Here are some examples. And so um, the legislative branch has power over the executive branch, okay? So the executive branch can't get th things done without the like base uh, cooperation of the legislative branch. And so um, uh, uh, one thing uh, that the, the power that the legislative branch has over the executive branch is that they can override a veto. So that a law will be passed by Congress, the president signs that, uh, vetoes that law, refuses it to sign it into law, and Congress with a two-thirds vote can override that veto. Another thing that the legislative branch can do um, that places a check on the executive branch is that if the uh, legislative branch thinks that the executive branch is engaging in some sort of abuse of power, they can call a special session um, or uh, create a special committee to investigate that abuse of power. And so um, there was concern that when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, um, that there was an abuse of power in the Benghazi, um, a terrorist attack, uh, and that there was some cover up there. And so Congress um, created committees to provide oversight in on the executive branch, on the Secretary of State, which is a part of the executive branch. And if they, you know, the legislative branch feels that the executive branch is uh, abusing its power, in particular the President of the United States, but other people can be um, impeached as well, uh, they can impeach that individual. And so we saw that happen with the Trump administration. President Trump was impeached twice. Um, he wasn't removed from office. But this is another mechanism that that place, that place allows government to um, provide a check on government, okay? And in this case, the legislative branch checking the executive branch. Executive has power over the legislative branch. Um, the, the executive branch can veto legislation, and it's difficult to get that two-thirds majority needed to override that veto, okay? Um, so the executive branch, um, uh, you know, does have, if they feel like the legislature, legislature has passed a really bad law, they can veto that law.
The VP, which is the vice president, which is a part of the executive branch, can end ties in the Senate. Uh, if the executive, if the president feels that the Congress is not doing their job, the president can call a special session of Congress, basically say, get back to work and do your job. And then the judicial branch of the Supreme Court in particular has power over the legislative and the executive branch. And we're going to be learning more about this during the course of the semester, that they have the power to exercise judicial review. So um, they review laws. And if the laws are deemed unconstitutional, um, those federal laws are null and void. And same with the executive branch. If the executive branch is engaging in actions that are unconstitutional, then the Supreme Court can say, you must stop engaging in these unconstitutional acts. And again, there's a chart in your textbook that you can take a look at that does a good outlining of the powers associated with checks and balances. There's one more feature about the architecture of democracy, another mechanism that the framers put in place to make sure that power wasn't going to be abused. We're going to be talking about that next week. And that, that power or that mechanism is the mechanism of federalism. And so next week, we're going to learn about another architect feature of another architecture of democracy, federalism. Um, and that is that the division of power between the national and state governments. Okay, thanks for listening. And um, I will talk to you again soon.